Let's get going. It's great to see another great crowd here. This is our repeat performance. This is the weirdest thing, doing a PowerPoint presentation twice in quick succession. Uh, but we're glad to see so many people here. We're actually live streaming this too, this kind of experiment. I don't know if you heard the number, Tom. We had 1,052 people watching the live stream viewing from the first session, so it's actually uh, pretty good. Um, welcome. So uh, we're going to give you a deep dive on the new Vulcan uh, API and the SPRB intermediate representation. And it's helpful for us, how many people went to the bow session this morning? I guess it's about the same ratio, about 50-50. So, so Tom will do a quick recap of what we went through uh, on the, in the bow session this morning, but then we'll go deep dive. We have the spec editors here, so you know, if you have questions, you have the right people in the room uh, to give you any information that you need. We want you to walk out of here knowing everything that we know about uh, the direction that we're going. So we have a bunch of good speakers. I'm Neil, uh, the person of the Cornell's group. I won't have listened to me very long. We have Tom, who's the um, Falcons Working Group Chair from ARM. Uh, we have Graham from AMD, who's the spec editor uh, for the Falcon API. John Kesnich, who's the Spear B editor. Uh, a bunch of other members who are gonna show demos and uh, uh, give us their experience so far. And we're planning to have pretty long Q&A session at the end, so if you have questions, uh, hang on to that thought and we'll, we'll get to you uh, at the end. And uh, my couple slides here at the front, just to introduce you to Kronos, if you're not familiar uh, with Kronos, we're an open standards organization. We have a, a very uh, laser-like focus on enabling developers to get to uh, cool hardware acceleration through standard open APIs. Uh, so graphics, compute, vision processing, uh, sensor processing, and we have a good quorum of the industry. We have the uh, platform vendors, the GPU vendors, and increasingly the, the application uh, developers, and games developers especially, and games engine uh, developers. Uh, we're really leaning in to uh, help us develop and formulate uh, the Vulcan uh, API uh, to meet the needs of the industry. So I think Kronos is one of the very few places where we can actually do a project like uh, Vulcan because we have the hardware and the software guys uh, willing to share enough information that we can really create a cooperative uh, design. So here at uh, uh, GNC we've actually announced three things. OpenCL 2.1, but we, that was done yesterday. Uh, we, we're going to focus on Vulcan uh, today, but also Sphere B. Vulcan is the API, Sphere B is the new intermediate representation. And um, I want to kind of draw your attention to Sphere B as well as Vulcan, because I think it's going to have a really fundamental impact on uh, the, the gaming ecosystem, mm -hmm. the graphics ecosystem in general. It's being used by both OpenCL uh, and uh, Vulcan, and it's going to, I think, enable a lot of innovation uh, in the language space. So uh, it's actually both equally exciting uh, to me. And I think the um, it's good timing to create this next generation of APIs. We need to make sure that there's a cross-platform open standard as this next generation of APIs rolls out. And uh, we hope that Vulkan will be the foundation for many of you over the next 25 years, like OpenGL has been over the last 25 years. So with that, I'll hand over to Tom. to assume the position. <laughs> Welcome, folks. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm Tom Olson, chair of the working group, formerly known as GL Next. Um, and we're here today to talk about uh, our little project. The, uh, the goal here was we consciously wanted, we knew that thanks to uh, Valve having graciously provided the space and the, the funding, we had that big session this morning where we were able to get a lot of people there. 
we couldn't afford to, to do a whole day of that sort of thing. It's very expensive. So this is the deep dive session, but we tried hard not to have a lot of overlap. So if you saw the morning session, most of what you see should be uh, not so much new, but it's a deeper level uh, than what you got this morning. But I do have to, for those who weren't here this morning, which is half the room, uh, I'll give as quick a recap as I can. Um, so history, if you go back before last summer, it's actually been many years that people have been aware that uh, the GL uh, franchise was getting stale and needed a reboot, uh, as games often do. Um, but it was very difficult to do for many reasons. Um, in June, July of 2014, the stars aligned and we had uh, changes in the external ecosystem, new APIs coming out that are frankly competitors, uh, and also demonstrating that there are new opportunities to, to do things in a better way, but a realization that, that we needed to move with that. So we had a, a critical mass got the project rolling um, with I have to say, uh, really gratifying commitment uh, from incredibly smart people in the industry. We went public with that project with the goals of it at Cigarette. Since then, we've been working like crazy people trying to get it done. It's not done, um, but we've made huge progress, and that's what we're here to share. Uh, so where we are today, um, we know basically what it's going to look like. There's a, a lot of decisions that are cast in stone. There are many significant numbers still in the air. Uh, we do have a header file, which we've agreed is the official alpha header, and we've got people doing implementations, we've got people targeting engines to it, and we're learning from that. And very likely, after this show, we're going to go back, and there's going to be a ton of ECRs saying, you know, when I was trying to port to this, I found it incredibly awkward heading. So we're going to end up changing things. That's why we're not releasing the header. It's too much in flight, it's too much in flux, and and we're churning it. It's not just that we're going to do one update, we're continuously updating it. Um, we are working on the, uh, the specification uh, for the API. The specification for the shading language is 90% eh, done, I would say. There's some graphics features still in the air. All the features for compute are pretty much cast in stone, and that's the Spear V provisional spec, which John will talk about uh, later this morning. So that's kind of where we are. Um, so what did we set out to do? What we said at SIGGRAPH uh, was to create a cross-platform open API for the new generation. We know there's a new style of API which experience has shown is a better way to create high-performance apps. We wanted something with that character, but with the goodness of, of GL that it is an open standard. It doesn't favor one architecture over another. Uh, and it's a completely clean break. We didn't bring over a line of main code anything. The only concepts we brought were there's such a thing as a graphics pipeline, and that's in the hardware. Uh, so the goals, uh, a clean architecture. Uh, it should uh, be possible to exploit multiple threads. I'm not talking about the driver. I'm talking about your application should be able to do graphics in multiple threads against one driver. Uh, much lower CPU overhead. Um, architecture neutral, that's always been a goal for GL, but in particular, uh, tile-based renderers in the mobile space have found that GL kind of presupposes an immediate model, and you end up having to fake a lot of stuff in order to make that run well on a tile-based architecture. Uh, in Vulkan, we're going to solve that, and the architecture will work equally well on tile-based and, and immediate mode renderers. Um, and I think the the hallmark and the mantra that we've been chanting for the past eight months uh, is explicit control. The application, the driver is not going to make guesses about what you mean. This API is set up so that you say explicitly, these are the kinds of things I want to do. The driver gets ready for it, does it quickly and quietly without any fuss. Um, so this is my summary of this morning's uh, set of slide decks from all those distinguished guys. Um, in a nutshell, how did we do these things? You'll hear it again from Graham, but in, in more detail. But the high points, um, so what a modern architecture means is instead of there being this monolithic context which contains all the state, the dispatch queues, uh, sort of it's the pipeline, the, the narrow straw through which you communicate to the GPU. Uh, instead, we separate state out. The state goes in command buffers uh, and queues, which are the things where you actually put stuff that you want the GPU to do. Uh, and 
those things are made, uh, well, I say pre-threaded. I told them that's a misuse of the term. What I mean is if uh, two different threads want to work on two different command buffers, that's fine. If one wants to, uh, if two of them want to read two different command buffers, that's fine, except I don't think we can read command buffers. But uh, what you can't do is two guys write the same thing at the same time. The API won't stop you. There are no interlocks. There are no semaphores built into the API calls. Uh, but if you do it, things won't work. Um, so that's how we get thread friendly, as well as by that architectural decision. The application is responsible for making sure it doesn't stomp on its own toes. Uh, low CPU overhead, the primary means we get that is that uh, um, all error checking, dependency tracking, et cetera, is no longer in the core API. The API has a rather elegant uh, layering structure. We're not going to say a ton about it. Graham will mention it some. Uh, but it's effectively, it's, it's a built-in loader with a built-in uh, sort of patchable uh, shim. You all know how like tracing tools work, right? They go in and shim all the calls. That's built into the API, and you can install your own shim layers. You can link with them and bind them in. Uh, so that's how we do debugging. That's how we do error checking and validation. If you want it, you turn it on when your app is, I mean, the opinion of your QA department, bug free, then you turn it off and it all runs faster. Uh, and again, explicit control, key idea here, you supply all the information the driver needs to know when it needs to know it. And the driver promises, I will not go and recompile behind your back at the moment that you're in your tight loop trying to submit geometry. We try, we do everything we can to move the heavy lifting early uh, and this, does mean that in some cases you will have tighter constraints on when you can change things, right? Like, no fair building this big complicated draw call and then saying, and, and it's all set to go, and at the last minute you say, actually I want to use a different mode. You can't do that. Um, so you will have some constraints, but the reward you get for that is predictable performance. Um, okay, so that's all I got to say, uh, except for a word at the end, except that I want to say, uh, a general thank you to the members of the working group. This is incredibly smart guys who have worked incredibly hard. Uh, and I, I can't tell you uh, what a great experience it is for a chairman to like not have to do any work. All these prices <laughs> will go up and they make magic happen. Uh, it's truly awesome. Um, and, but I also particularly want to thank, uh, I guess I will thank Valve as well. Valve, uh, I have to say, played a special role in many of the projects we're talking about. Uh, John, uh, it's not Kasimich, is it? Kasimich. Uh, we'll, we'll mention them a little more, but they've done incredible work with tooling. They hosted one of our first meetings at their own expense. They hosted our morning session at their expense. Uh, they've really done super stuff, and I'm very grateful. But the slide I've got is to thank another company. Um, committees are really good at taking an existing specification and knocking the rough corners off of it and making it better. Uh, they are very bad at coming up with that kernel. Design by committee is a curse in the technology industry for very good reason. Uh, so the first problem we had was where do we start? And so we went back and forth about that and there were some proposals and even Arm made a proposal. Um, and we were progressing but it was very painful and eventually uh, the folks from AMD said, you know what, you need a place to start. Here's the math of specification. Uh, you can start with that no strings attached, you know, use it, uh, please don't break it. But, but uh, they basically made us a gift of all the work that they had done, which as you all know is very substantial. So that was truly awesome and I have to say we would not be where we are today without that. So thanks AMD guys. So, uh, <laughs> and without further ado, I'm gonna bring up an AMD guy this is Graham Sellers, is one of the two specification editors. Is Bill here? Bill Lycia Kane of Qualcomm is his co editor, uh, and he's going to talk about what he's going to talk about. <laughs> oh, sorry, I think uh, it would be better if you wear the mic.
Okay, so um, hi, Graham Sellers, uh, May and uh, I work on oh, I said I'd be between the lines here. Railroad. Um, I, I work on OpenGL, and now I'm, I'm responsible for Vulkan. Um, I've been with AMD for a while doing OpenGL stuff. I wrote the Super Bible. Uh, my focus has shifted to Vulkan. That's what I'm doing, um, and uh, so I'm going to whip through a whole Vulkan application from start to finish. All the things that you need to do to just get something up, render, present, shut the application down. Uh, this is all kind of pseudo code uh, These are real API calls that are in our draft header right now, um, but the details are kind of obfuscated um, because we're still finalizing everything, as Tom said. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, Vulkan itself is represented by an instance, uh, and the, the instance is where all the state goes. There are no global variables, there's no thread local storage or anything like that in Vulkan. It's all very explicit where the state lives. Um, the Vulkan instance basically represents this loader um, that Tom mentioned. Um, the loader is responsible for finding all the drivers on the system, aggregating them together, uh, discovering which GPU to plug in, and then making it look like one coherent system with multiple GPUs in it. Um, so you create the, uh, the instance um, of the loader, uh, with this API call here, um, and you hand it some information. Uh, some information is about your application um, and the kind of behaviors that you're gonna uh, uh, perform with the, with the API, and memory allocation callbacks. The very first call into the API, you hand it some function pointers to a memory allocator. Uh, these are optional, um, but if you do hand them uh, those pointers, Vulkan will allocate all memory with your allocator. So you have complete control over system memory allocations uh, with that. When you have an instance, you can ask it about the GPUs in the system. It'll hand back uh, a list of the GPUs that are present uh, in an array and the number of them. Uh, and those GPUs can all be from different vendors. You might have an integrated and a discrete. You might have multiple discrete GPUs from the same or different vendors. Um, we're working on mechanisms to enable multi-GPU support. Uh, there's no crossfire SLI stuff, really. Um, the idea is that the application would directly drive each GPU in the system. Uh, how much resource sharing we can do between GPUs of the same vendor or different vendor the different classes of GPUs are integrated and discrete, we'll have to battle out the details. Uh, but certainly some level of multi-GPU support is in there. Uh, you can query information about each of the GPUs in the system. Uh, some of the kinds of information that you might be able to get is how much memory the GPU has, or what the relative performance is. Probably not going to give absolute performance figures. It's very hard to quantify, but at least this is the high performance GPU and this is the integrated GPU, the kind of information that we might be able to provide. Um, what kinds of queues it has and, and what kind of features the GPU might have. Um, and then for sharing resources between GPUs, um, we have an API where you can just say, here's GPU 1, GPU 2, can you guys get along? And they will say yes or no for various different kinds of resources and what kinds of sharing facilities are there. So in all likelihood, two identical GPUs in the same vendor, everything will just work. Um, radically different GPUs in different vendors, it might be using very limited or no sharing at all. Uh, so the GPU kind of represents like a graphics card. Uh, the device, uh, is the logical representation of that thing. So you can create a device that represents your connection to that GPU, and that's how you talk to the GPU. Uh, and the device has a number of queues, uh, and when you create the device, you tell it which uh, queues you want to use, which features you want to use, and also any extensions. So we, we extensions are first class things in this API, just as they were in GL before. The big difference being in GL before, you just ask the driver what extensions do you support and then start using them. Um, in this uh, API, you have to say, I'd like to use these extensions, and the driver, you opt into them. You can't accidentally start using extensions. Uh, so this kind of will ease some extension pain. Uh, also, <coughs> the level of validation and which layers you want to enable for a particular device is all in this information structure. Uh, so as Tom mentioned, there's a, there's a layering structure where we can have various levels of validation or API capture or debugging tools and things like that can be per device. So the device represents essentially a stack of layers. Uh, now each device has a number of queues. When you create the device, you tell it which queues you want to use. The GPU tells you which queues you can use. Um, the queues are kind of arranged in a two-dimensional grid. 
of uh, kind of families, which might be you know a compute queue and a graphics queue, and then the device will say, well, and I have so many of this kind of queue and so many of those kinds of queues. The queues in the, in the API are compute queues, graphics queues, and DMA queues. Um, if, and one queue can support multiple things. So for example, on AMD's implementation, we have a queue that can support graphics and compute. Um, and we, that might, if you're familiar with Mantle, that's called the universal queue. Uh, but you could really have any kind of topology you want. I have 25 compute queues and four graphics queues. Something that'll work. Uh, each queue is scheduled uh, independently from all the others and run asynchronously to one another. There are synchronization mechanisms in the API that I'll get to shortly. Uh, queues execute command buffers. Okay, We package up commands together in these uh, command buffers. You can create them. They're, they're logical objects. Uh, you can make as many as you want and fill them from different threads. Um, so you can go very wide in your engine just fill up lots of different command buffers. As long as you're hitting different command buffers and different threads, everything will just work. You tell the device which queue family you're going to submit the command buffer on, so the driver can optimize for that queue family or do different things win the command buffer, depending on where it's going to get submitted. So then you put your commands in the command buffer. You have this begin command buffer, do one thing, do another thing, end the command buffer. This is where all the heavy lifting happens. This is where the complexity of the driver really is. Um, and this is where you've gone wide in your application and threaded. So any heavy work that does need to get done gets done in multiple threads, uh, and you can make use of all your CPU resources for that. Even so, uh, the amount of driver work that is going to happen when you call these APIs is still much, much less than it was in previous APIs. So your CPU time will not only be lower per core, but you can use more cores uh, this way. Uh, shaders. Compile your shaders up front. The only input language officially supported by Vulkan is Spear V. Right? This is part of the core. You can compile it offline. Uh, there is a available offline compiler to go from GLSL to Spear V are available today. Um, and you know other IRs could be uh, added in the future, different types of IRs, vendor extensions, and whatnot. Um, and then any other information about the shader uh, goes in this creation function. And the driver will do as much work as it can up front here. Eventually, you start creating pipelines. And pipelines have all the shaders attached to them, uh, along with a bunch of fixed function state. Uh, about blending and depth testing and you know wh what your stencil state is and all of these things. It goes in there. You can make some of this state mutable. That means you can change it after the fact. But you have to say right here which state is going to be mutable. And then we get into objects that can be bound back into this uh, pipeline uh, at a later date. So you can turn depth testing on and off. Um, the pipelines themselves can be serialized. Uh, so you can even cache them. Uh, the big difference between this and, say, GL's you know, get program binary is that all of the information is here in this pipeline. So if you save out a pipeline and load it back in, there should be, in theory, no driver work to be done once the, the pipeline is loaded back in, no draw time validation. Uh, like I said, some state can be mutable. It's generally wrapped up into smaller objects. So for example, you might have blend state, viewport state, uh, depth stencil state in a, in a smaller object, which you would then bind back into the pipeline through special APIs. Resources of textures and samplers, buffers, uh, they're represented by a CPU and a GPU component. Uh, the CPU component is the API visible object. You create these things through creation functions. You pass in a structure of data about what the object is going to be. These objects are immutable from a layout perspective. So they have fixed dimensions and formats and these things. Um, but their contents are mutable. You can put new data into your textures uh, at a later date. Uh, but not only do you have the CPU side of the object, but it's the application's responsibility to manage and allocate the GPU resources for the object. So to do that, you ask the object about its requirements, memory requirements. It'll tell you that it needs one or two or three uh, GPU memory allocations and what the um, types of allocations there are. So if the GPU has different pools of memory, it might require an allocation from this pool or that pool. Uh, so you get the information about the object from the API. You allocate memory of the correct type and bind it to uh, the object. Now you can create a very large pool of memory and then put lots and lots of objects in that one pool of, of memory and write your own allocators. You can also alias resources on top of each other by 
finding the same piece of memory to multiple resources if you know that those resources will never be used at the same time. So you can recycle a memory allocation. So you're not going in and out of the driver allocating a free uh, memory as you create resources. Uh, the GPU side, in addition to its memory that backs the content, is represented by a descriptor. Descriptors are stored in descriptor sets. Descriptor sets are allocated from pools. So you have a small pool allocator from which you allocate descriptor sets. Uh, each set has a layout. So your set might have, say, 20 textures and two samplers and an SSB element. Um, and so you define the layout, and then you use the layout when you create the, the program state object, the pipeline state object, and when you create descriptor sets. And these things must match. Now you can switch pipelines, and you can switch descriptor sets without cross-validating layouts of descriptors. Um, and so long as the descriptor sets match between two pipelines, you can switch them at any time. Um, the, and the, so the layout is per set, and a pipeline might have multiple set bindings, and so the sequence of bindings uh, in the pipeline state object is represented by a layout chain. Uh, and this mechanism, <coughs> so hierarchical mechanism, it basically allows hardware that has fixed function binding and the more bindless kind of bindings uh, to operate efficiently. Now we get to rendering. All rendering is bucketed in the, into render passes. And these are logical passes, um, phases of your frame. Uh, you create a render pass. The render pass has information about what to do when it begins and ends. Uh, this kind of information is vitally important to a, a tile renderer, or specific, especially uh, deferred renderers that might be binning and know what to need to move data in and out of on chip memories. But it's also very useful for um, for immediate renderers that we can determine what to do with cache data and, and compressed texture and information. That kind of thing. Uh, so now you have your render pass. You begin the render pass. This is now commands going into a command buffer. Uh, you bind pipeline objects. You bind your descriptor sets into the pipeline. You call a draw. Um, and then you end the render pass. Right? Uh, so all of this is bound into the command buffer. This is basically where state is. The command buffer is basically the closest thing we have to a context. Right? There's no global state. All the state is per command buffer. Uh, we don't track state. Uh, drivers can't track state across command buffers because you could build 10 command buffers and then submit them in the opposite order that you built them in. So there's really no way to track state across command buffers. So the driver is very, very thin here. All the draw types are supported, uh, including indirect draws and compute shaders and all these kind of more recent features. Uh, so I say this is all asynchronous. We need some synchronization primitives. We have events. Uh, event objects are kind of what you would expect. That you can set them, reset them wait on them, you can set and reset them from the GPU or the CPU. And command buffers can also be asked to signal an event as they complete. So you can wait on the completion of a complete command buffer. Uh, for synchronizing within a command buffer, uh, we, uh, access to resources, so writing to a texture and then reading from it, or across a sequence of uh, render passes we have these uh, barriers, and barriers are execution flow control primitives that tell the GPU what to do with resources when you move them from different parts of the lifetime. Um, so we're not gonna track the state of a resource. It's up to you that when you're rendering to a texture and then you want to go read from it, you have to tell the driver, okay, I've done rendering to this, now make it readable, and the driver will do the work right there that you told it to do to make the texture readable, right? Um, if you get it wrong, we will render garbage or crash. Well, I don't know. It's totally undefined. So in order to make this a little less painful for you, uh, the validation layer will quite possibly track the state of different resources as you submit the command buffers. Remember, the state of the resource is really determined by the execution order of the command buffers, not the commands that you put into them, because you could submit them out of order. So once you've got these command buffers and you're ready to submit them, you just submit them on the queue. Right? Uh, you have an array of command buffers, you call a submission. Um, which resources the command buffer might touch uh, is also not going to be tracked by the driver. You just need to make sure that the memory objects that are backing those resources are visible to the queue that you're executing the command buffer on. So we have these add memory reference, remove memory reference, and the driver will keep a list of all the things you say might get touched by the, by the command buffers. Um, if you want to touch a resource from multiple queues, you're going to need to use some kind of a semaphore to 
sort of marginal ownership of the resource between the different queues. So we have uh, queue semaphores here that can signal and wait on the semaphore so you can uh, track who owns which resource at which time. To present, to get your pretty picture on the screen, uh, we have a presentation system. Um, we have this, the, so it's not part of the core API, it's more like an extension. Um, and we actually have um, a, a part of the working group that specializes in this thing is kind of defining to you. There are basically two families of presentation mechanisms. One is where you have a compositing window system that owns the surface that you're going to present. And you have to ask it for the next surface and render onto it and then say, I'm done, and it will present it for you. The other kind of major family is where you, the application, owns the renderable surface and you hand it to the compositor and say, here, put this on the screen. And those are the sort of major families, and so we're probably going to end up with two uh, bindings uh, covering a wide gamut of um, you know, everything from small mobile devices to big full screen gaming rigs. Um, the WSI also is going to deal with things like going full screen, uh, changing the display mode, uh, turning VSync on and off, and all the other things associated with displays. Uh, when you're ready to present, you submit the presentation command through a command buffer, or through the queue, sorry. So you submit your command buffers, and then you submit a present, and the present happens after all the command buffers are executed. Uh, once you're done, you need to tear down. Uh, there are no dangling references. There's nothing tracking your the object lifetime. There's nothing implicit here. When you say delete this object, the object gets deleted. And if there's a pending command buffer sitting in a queue somewhere and it touches the resource, you've got to use up the delete and everything blows up. Uh, there's no reference counting. We don't want you calling into the API through layers to increment a variable. Right? If you want to wrap up some of these objects in a smart pointer or something, knock yourself out. It's fine. It's probably the better way to do it anyway. Um, if you bind an object, say, to a frame buffer, and then delete the object and render to the frame buffer, it'll blow up. Right? If you uh, bind the object to the frame buffer and delete the frame buffer, the object will just, you'll leak it. It'll still be there. Uh, most of the objects are destroyed with this destroy object. Some objects are kind of special, the instance, for example, the device, because the device has sub-objects inside of it. So it's the one you want to tear them down especially. So ASDO. ASDO is um, <coughs> a, a suite of techniques that I presented at GDC last year with some of the um, folks that are working on this now. Um, there was some techniques to try and reduce CPU overhead in, in classic GL. Vulkan is already very low overhead API, right? Uh, so there's less of a need for that kind of stuff now. But um, I think that if you have the opportunity to use some of those techniques, you should and can in, a, in Vulkan. Uh, so one thing to note is, because you can build a command buffer and submit it many times, you amortize the cost of building the command buffer, which is already very low, across a number of submissions. So it really does literally approach zero, as if you submit it enough times. Uh, for bindless textures, we debated the need to put bindless textures as a first class thing. Uh, in the API, but we, uh, the descriptive sets that textures live in are basically unbounded in size. In fact, you can make an unbounded array of resources at the end of your descriptive set uh, and then hand indices into your shader. So those become your texture handles. We already have explicit memory residency control, so you have bindless effectively. Sparse textures, if you don't bind memory to, an, uh, to a texture object, it's a sparse texture. Right, multi drawer indirectors in the API, shader draw parameters, all of these kind of ASDO type uh, techniques are perfectly doable in, in Vulkan. So, in summary, uh, Vulkan is not really a low level API, it's just a much better abstraction of how the hardware really works today. So, if you know the hardware, you can drive it with this API. Right? It has very low overhead, it's designed explicitly for threading, but even if you just crammed everything into one thread, it would still perform way, way better. Uh, than, than traditional APIs do. Um, you also get to reuse a lot of work. Building a command buffer and submitting it many times amortizes that cost over the number of submissions. And so it does actually make it cheaper to use this API. Um, of course, as a Kronos standard, it's uh, not tied to a single OS or GP vendor or our overall architecture. Um, it's extensible. We're going to, as vendors, we want to put our latest and greatest in your hands. Um, we're looking to make mobile, you know, is a really as a first class citizen. We put a lot of effort into making sure the tile based architectures can use this efficiently. Um, and then, you know, we have all this tool infrastructure uh, going on, but really, um, I think I need to 
state of the game, that Spear V, uh, which John is going to speak about momentarily, is really, really, really cool that we can have this open, well-documented intermediate representation that we can share across APIs that are part of OpenCL. Uh, we have a reference compiler for it, but you guys should definitely write your own compiler too. I mean, write your own high-level languages, write node-based editors that spit this stuff out directly, write whatever you want to do, um, and, and really take advantage of Sphere V as a, as a technology. Uh, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Graham. So our next speaker, uh, John Kesenick. Uh, from Liturgy, we'll be talking about Spear V, a uh, specification editor for Spear V. Yeah, you do it. Hi, I'm John Kesnick, Networking Line, uh, specification editor for Spear V, and the senior compiler architect and language guy from Liturgy. Uh, I'd like to talk just both about the kind of the high level view of Sphere V and Dive and put a couple slides deeper into what it, kind of language it is on the inside. Um, Sphere, Sphere V is the, the, the latest in the components existing Sphere family for standard portable intermediate representations. Um, the, the, the goal is to have a portable binary representation I'll have a picture coming up with, just to have a lot of different source languages and compilers all coming down into one intermediate representation, which you then distribute, and then drivers, OpenCL, and as well as, as, well as the, the graphics drivers, all consuming that same intermediate representation. One of the reasons, reasons to do this are one, one, one is the IIP issue of not, not having to ship your shaders with all the clever tricks and stuff in the source code on, on, on your user's platform. You can ship a binary that's a little bit obfuscated and requires tools to decipher that protects your IP some. There's, there's a big improvement in portability. One of the problems with the high level languages is they're full of convenience features to make it easier for humans to, to code and it's, it's complicated to get the specifications for those languages just with the, to the rigorousness needed to be completely portable. With an intermediate representation, it's easier to um, completely specify the, the, the rules, and so there'll be a, a, an increase in portability. And then this last one with the compilation time. Now all, all, all drivers will have to, or I should say typical drivers are going to have to take Spear V and still translate it to their own machine-specific instruction set and register allocate it and schedule it. So that time will always be taken, it's not going to go away. But there are other parts of the, the, the stack that go away and we'll see an increase in uh, compilation time from that for the, the stuff that do get offloaded. So Spear V is a, it's a brand new intermediate language. It's, um, it's not based on or layered on top of another uh, IR. It's fully specified by Kronos. As, as a Kronos defined standard, it's, it's, it's all there in, in, in the spec, and it can natively represent the kinds of constructs you see in graphical shaders and compute shaders, um, you know, texture lookups with, with things like implicit derivatives, or if you move that uh, texture call across the control flow, you might get a different answer because the derivative changed. It's all, it's all built into the language, these very specific um, graphics and compute idioms. That's native, natively representing what needs to be there. And it also has different memory and execution models for uh, different shader stages, different needs of compute and graphics. Um, gra gra graphics in particular, to today with GLSL, doesn't use pointers, and point pointers can cause a bunch of extra complexity in your, your compiler stack, so there's a way to use it without pointers. It, like Graham just said, this is the it, it is the language accepted by, by Vulkan. There aren't any other languages accepted. The high-level languages 
are still supported and kernels will still provide GLSL in high level languages. It's just that it's a separate step to translate your GLSL to Spear V and then the only way to get it into the Vulkan API is through the, with Spear V through the entry point there. And, and, and of course, you know, this, this, this enables the, the innovation of, of you, you can invent whatever shading language you want to invent and translate it to Spear V. And it's the similar story for OpenCL and Compute. So, obviously, I guess I probably said it, this lets you, we kind of cut the, split the compiler chain in, in half. There's a front end and the back end. It actually starts to get confusing to say the word compile because you don't know what, does that mean you're compiling to Spear V or does it mean you're compiling your target architecture? So we tend to say front end for the, the first half of it and back, back end for the, 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 the second half of it. Um, and it's, it's not that the front end is not required, the front end is just absent from the driver. So there's, there's, there's no front end in the driver. And Kronos is, is, is looking at for providing those um, as a separate step. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper here and talk about some of the, the details, what, what, what is the, the nature of this language. The, the first of all, it's a binary intermediate language. I have a slide coming up for that. Uh, the functions. Well, after you've created a Spear V module, basically has a list of functions in it, and each function has a list of basic blocks in it, and the basic blocks are hooked up in a, in a control flow graph, a CFG of, uh, of the blocks. And control flow is a little bit special for graphical shaders, I'll have a slide on that. Memory and all the I.O., the input and output variables, uniform variables, general memory is all done by allocating the variable and doing loads and stores. So you do loads and stores to do your I.O. The intermediate results after you load a variable, you do an operation on a variable, all of that are all named, and it's, it's using single static assignment. Actually, types and every, every, everything that you create, except for store and a few other things, has, has a name, which is a number, because it's a binary format. And, and there, there's, only, there's exactly one place that defines any particular name. So if you see an add of two operands, got one of those operands, the operand is a name, there's going to be exactly one place somewhere else in the module that defines that name, uh, not multiple places. That, that's a, you, can, you can look up more about that if you're not familiar with it. It's a, it's a pretty standard modern technique in IRs these days. Um, so the data objects, I'll have a slide coming up on that to show a little bit more. The point is this is not, this is not being register allocated to some flat register set that would be too low level. We don't want to lose the information. So it's, it's staying at a higher level than that. It's easy to extend this. I already talked about pointers. It, it, it's easy to extend this. There's, there's lots of uh, enumerations, set of sets of enumerations in each one. You can, you can carve out a range for a particular language or a particular vendor and add your own opcodes and memory models or whatever else you want to add as an extension. And these things can be merged back together when you have their own so it's, it's very easy to extend. You can do natively in your extension whatever you want to do. There's no need for metadata and things like that. And th there's already built-in debug information for line numbers and in, in, any, any de debug name. Any, anything can have a debug name associated with it. And it's very easy to strip that back out again if you, if you don't want to be shipping it around. So here's Here's kind of a physical look at the, the binary form. It, it, it's on the right. I won't read through all the way through that, but each, each one of those rows is a 32-bit word. The, the binary form is, is a linear stream of 32-bit words. That's all it is. The first five words are the magic number and version number, a couple things like that, and then all the rest of it is a linear sequence of instructions. And each instruction is several words, but a, a variable number of words, but it, it knows how many words it is. So first thing the instruction says is, I'm, I'm five words or I'm seven words, and tools that are processing for specific things or stripping stuff out, they, they can easily skip through the, the, the file by, by looking at the, the size of the, the instruction and just skipping to the next instruction. And that's the whole thing. That's, that's the whole physical format is that linear list of instructions that know how, how far it is to the next instruction. It's very, very, very simple. Um, and, and of course, th 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 this is, this is um, as a stream of words, it's, a, it's a, an in-memory format. You, you, you could also save it to a file 
and you deduce the MDNS of your, your file from looking at the magic <laughs> number. So plunking that binary into the middle of the picture here, this is the, the main hub, the, what, what should make the, the ecosystem allow all sorts of interesting new stuff to come along. Uh, obviously, we talked about the, the, the top level things here, like the high level languages translating into Spear V, but Spear V is high enough level IR, it can also go to other languages, including high level languages. And on the left here, it's easy for it to, to target or be the target of other intermediate uh, forms. Um, you know, OpenCL in particular has, has used the, the, the previous Spear form, and it'll be very easy to translate between those. And then, of course, on the bottom, you have um, OpenCL and uh, graphics drivers taking the Spear V and compiling it down to the target architecture. So this is, I, I think this is the place where there's, there's lots of room for new innovation and inventions, and we'll find new, new, new parts of this picture that, to do interesting stuff, like Graham was saying, make your own language, whatever you want to do. Structured flow control, I just want to say a little bit about this. Um, GLSL has nested structured flow control and that a lot of the target architectures, if, if you kind of simplify them down to thinking of SIMD, they, have, they also like nested um, control flow because control flow basically splits the direction when you have lots of elements are working at the same time. It splits them to go different directions and you want them to come back together again to keep processing the, the, them all together, which is, that's just kind of the same concept of having nested structured control flow like you have in GLSL, no go-tos. Like you, you can always escape out of something with a break or a continue or return, but otherwise you have nested constructs. And, and so Spear V, because of the importance of the Spear V, has instructions, these, these loop merge and selection merge instructions to represent the structured flow control. Without that, a CFG looks like spaghetti code, and if you do an optimization to it, it turns into different spaghetti code, and it's hard to recover or see the, the way that the control flow nests. So Spear V solves that problem using these instructions, which, which are optional. You're not required to represent structured flow control in Spear V, but if you want to, you, you, you can. And currently, the, the, the definition of Vulkan says you have to for graphical shaders. You, you want to preserve the, the domestic flow control. I think the, the battery might be dying. This, thing, this red oh, battery sorry, might be dying. I have no problem. <laughs> it's like the space key. So the, the types like I said earlier, they weren't flattened out into some, you know, 1,024 bank <laughs> registers. The, the, the hierarchy of complex types is still represented in Spear. The, the, this is like a, a GLSL or a C, whatever, struct in, in the middle. These things are built up from, from leaves, bottom up, up, up on the right here, is kind of human-readable Spear V building this structure up one instruction at a time. <coughs> you can see the, 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 the types of like flows are parameterized by how many bits wide they are. You can make a 16-bit flow, 64-bit flow, whatever you want to do. Vectors are parameterized by how many um, components are in them. Matrix is parameterized by vectors and how many rows there are, et cetera, all the way up to struct. So you just, one instruction at a time, build up the, the types that you want. They're all templatized, parameterized, and, and you, you, you maintain the structure that way. It doesn't go away. So I think we talked about, this is just a recap of this slide, I think we talked about just about everything here. Um, and <laughs> I think so. Yeah, something happened. Something happened. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go to the call of action yeah. slide, which I, I think you, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a theme of the presentation oh, this as well. My, this is my slide. It's the same slide, though. So, yeah, it's good enough. I'll hand this off to you and you can speak to the slide. If I can remember what it's about. If you have any questions, there'll be Q&A at the end of this. Right, yeah, so I have to say it is a bizarre experience giving the same presentation twice. Uh, so I actually mean this, because we're going to, actually, we are now into uh, well, we finished with the call to action. So, uh, oh, this is the call to action for Spear, Spear V. Um, 
So I'm going to let it speak for itself. It's got links. And I have another call to action coming later. So we're now going into Jack in the Box mode. We have a bunch of members who have uh, brief uh, statements to make or things to show to give you a sense of how this is like. After that, I'll give a second call to action and we'll uh, throw it open for Q&A. And we've got a significant amount of time for that. That's by design because we figured you might have questions. Um, so uh, our, we're just going to do them one at a time. Uh, first speaker is Jesse Barker from our, my colleague. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so, right, I'm Jesse Barger. I'm uh, sort of uh, half of uh, the prototyping team for, uh, <laughs> for, for, for Vulcan on Mali and ARM. Uh, and we, we sort of set out uh, to have more or less a single goal, which was to, to prove to ourselves and to the rest of the working group that, as, as Tom pointed out and, and, and Grant pointed out, that we had an API that would really truly reflect the ability to, uh, to express explicitly what it is that the application wanted to do and that and that, that should be true both for the traditional forward renders as well as for uh, for, for tile based and deferred renders like like ours and, and, and some of the other Kronos members. And so so to that end that's that's exactly what we set out to do. And uh, also I think um, uh, I'm sure the question will come up about hardware levels and, and things like that. One of the things that we wanted to do was prove that we could do this with today's hardware. Uh, so to that end, um, we started off um, working with, uh, with a, a platform that's pretty much like probably what half of your phones have inside of it. That's a current generation uh, GPU, um, uh, uh, funky, heterogeneous octa-core. Um, but anyway, a, a, a pretty current piece of hardware just to make sure that we were, again, we were keeping ourselves honest for the sake of what the API is trying to accomplish. Um, we didn't try to get too crazy. You know, this is super unoptimized. This is basically leveraging pieces of our existing ES stack and uh, sort of rewiring it and to, to, to implement Vulkan. And uh, that, you know, we, we, what we really wanted to show was that there are CPU cycles that are being consumed by the driver that shouldn't be, that should really be given back to, to the, the engines and the applications. And so that's, that's sort of where we were, where we were headed with it. Um, our test case for this is the, the model that you see there on the right, um, and it's a thousand meshes, three materials, just like it says there. And uh, we, we have a, a simple test program that basically draws that using ES and draws that using Vulkan, and we measure the CPU cycles that it took to, to build that frame of information for both APIs. And, and, and the driver, make sure. So, sorry. Uh, it's driver. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Right, we're, we're measuring the time actually spent in, in driver code, so not, uh, not, anything, not anything above that. Sorry, that, that wasn't clear, my bad. Um, right, so uh, the, the punchline here is we're seeing, for, for that particular load, we're seeing it takes about a fifth of the time uh, to build that frame using Vulkan that, that, it, that it took with our, with our current ES driver. And that's, you know, technique to technique, not, you know, we didn't, we didn't play any games with Let's do this more optimally here than we're doing it there. It's it's just a straight up apples to apples comparison, measuring exactly the same uh, work that you're doing in both cases inside the driver, and and it's just this, and this is where we are today. Just just putting a prototype together. This is as I said, no advanced work to do any optimization or or to e even do some things terribly efficiently. So we're very very excited about. Uh, the promise of this and where we where we have the potential to take it. Um, so that's I think everything I have. Tom, if, uh, Super. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, now we're going to need Neil to help me with the magic. And uh, Laszlo. Uh, Laszlo may have had a meeting and have to go. So I, I, I'm wondering whether Slavic should talk about it. Uh, there's there's a little bit more than just the Vulcan thing, and maybe we. I'm wondering what's on. Right. Yeah, yeah. Slavic, do you want to talk about it? And, and you could do the, for that matter, you could do the Intel demo now if you want. I think 
think it's basically written what's, what's my, my conditions say. It's a GF, GFX benchmark 5 is a benchmark from Kishanti that's supposed to run across multiple APIs. So it's a still in a concept stage and in the pre alpha stage, the same applies to our driver. Louder. <laughs> the same applies to our driver that can run this workload, and we, can, we are showing this in our, our booth, and also I can try to demonstrate it here. So this is the GFX 5 benchmark or clock running on the Volcan API. So the sophisticated demo or in-house so demo that shows the benefits of Vulkan IBI. So <coughs> this is the demo that uh, draws this as I think using 200,000 draw calls. And currently it runs in OpenGL mode where we can see the frames per second is around at 8, 27 frames. We can see the GPU and CPU power on the left upper hand side, and on the right side we can see the CPU workloads on the cards that are present on this uh, ultra book. So what's what I'm seeing is that the driver runs on the CPU zero, and as you can see that this uh, CPU is quite busy. Then we switch over to the Vulkan API, a few things happened. Basically, the frames per second increased to 40 frames per second. Uh, GPU power increased because we are rendering more uh, geometry onto the screen. The CPU power went down. And at the same time, the CPU load of the CPU zero went down. And this Vulkan, <coughs> Vulkan uh, demo runs in multi threaded mode. And the work of this evenly split between the cores. Even though we have one the application, we render most more geometry using less CPU power. Thank you. Thank you, Sonic. That's awesome. Please welcome Luis Sommerfeld from Imagination. Hi there. Um, so the goal of our um, experiments with Vulcan were to kind of, same as ARMS, validate the, the kind of high-level goals of the API on our uh, rogue architecture. So um, we're a tile-based deferred renderer, which means certain hardware semantics when we're rendering, and modern or kind of existing APIs don't really map well to um, our architecture. Uh, they leave kind of a lot of goodness that we have in there kind of on the table and we kind of leak performance away and efficiency and things because of the old APIs. So, um, our goal with our Vulkan experiment was to see if Vulkan uh, 
let us express our architecture a bit better in terms of kind of solving your problem with rendering, uh, making sure that it used our architecture properly. Uh, validate whether we had less CPU overhead, uh, number four, which is kind of a key design goal of the API. So, um, over a couple of months, we took a cut of the header. Uh, we implemented what we needed for the header in the demo. Um, two driver engineers, only took them two months. One demo engineer, uh, on and off, actually, he didn't work for the full two months. Um, and we took an existing ES3 demo that we'd already written uh, for Rogue, uh, ported it to Vulkan, and we had a look and see what happened. It's not the exact same renderer, we had to leave some things out for time reasons, um, but it's pretty much everything that we had in the, the existing ES3 demo, we ported it to Vulkan, um, and we got to see what happened. It wasn't a, a GPU limited demo, so we, we weren't expecting to see any higher actually frame rate, and we didn't, but we did see significantly reduced uh, CPU overhead from uh, using Vulkan to render the demo. Of almost an order of magnitude less. So, uh, high level design goals of the API were kind of met for us in just this short window on small experiments. So, um, we're very happy with how the API maps to our architecture and how we think the other kind of the tilers are going to feel the same way. And it just is, of course, it's all still a good fit for IMARs and things like that. So, it's now a nice across the board, we believe, uh, API for kind of all modern graphics architectures that are in the market. So, uh, I have a short demo for you. Uh, see you So this is running on off-the-shelf uh, consumer uh, hardware that implements RO, uh, it's Intel-based, uh, uh, latest Atom, uh, with a four cluster uh, Series 6, so it's our, our kind of base rogue architecture, not the, any of the latest IPs, it's the kind of the first rogue uh, we came out with and Vulkan supports that hardware. So there we are, it's just a, a bit stretched on that one, uh, finding this one over here. So. Um, yeah, it's just our ES3 demo. We no frame rate counter. Uh, just wanted to show off the Vulkan works in our architecture. We driver came up in two months. Everything fine. Renders everything okay. Um, there's some bits and pieces we'll talk about in the Q and A. Some interesting implementation things if you ask the right questions. <laughs> <laughs> there we are, up and running. Up and running on our stuff just like the other guys. Very quickly, two months. Next speaker is going to be Piers Daniel from NVIDIA. So we're going to need to switch machines again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, we need help. Thank you. Well, my name is Piers Daniel. I'm a driver engineer at NVIDIA. And um, we've been bringing up our um, Vulkan driver, just like everybody else. And um, one of the things I wanted to show today is, is just demonstrate the um, how much lower overhead, driver overhead, uh, Vulkan offers um, versus OpenGL. Now, this is a workstation benchmark that is actually uh, public. Uh, you can play with, with OpenGL. And it has different ways of rendering uh, this fairly complex um, geometry-wise um, model here. I think it's got about a million vertices. Um, in, in this regular mode, oh, I should also point out that right here at the top of the title bar, you can see the performance. So we're, we're taking about 40 milliseconds per frame to draw this on my humble laptop right here. Um, we can be less smart about our use of OpenGL. Um, right now, we're grouping things by material and sorting things just to keep down the, the number of draw calls we make. It's one of the bottlenecks of OpenGL, and you make lots of small draw calls and make state changes between them. It can really slow things down. So this is a demonstration of, of how much slower OpenGL can go if you're not being clever. So we've gone from 40 milliseconds down to 100, um, 141 milliseconds per frame. So we're going a lot slower. You can kind of see that it's getting a little laggy. 
Now another thing um, that OpenGL doesn't do as well as Vulkan does is that if you do draw calls and state changes and then program changes as well. So we're going to add in uh, program changes between uh, batches of draw calls, and that's to draw the lines uh, going around each of the solid objects. Um, so now our performance has gone right down to 400 milliseconds per frame. Um, so now if we switch it into Vulkan mode, you can see how we've gone from 400 milliseconds per frame all the way down to 65 frames. Um, per frame. And now it's a lot more interactive. And that's doing all the same work for drawing the solids and the lines and doing the program switches between the drawers. And it just is a demonstration on, on this machine and this setup, just the comparison between uh, what um, you know, a naive implementation, app implementation using GL versus what they can do with Vulkan. Um, this, our Vulkan implementation isn't um, speed of light yet. Um, uh, we, I have a little demonstration of what speed of light might look like um, with Vulkan. Uh, we have this extension, uh, this OpenGL extension called ND Command List. Um, it's, it's really a speed of light to the metal in, uh, way of rendering lots of geometry. Um, so we expect our Vulkan implementation to be about this speed for the single threaded apps. So we'll get right down to about 10 milliseconds per frame. Uh, we're super excited about this API. Okay, so getting set up. Um, my name is Peter Lorman, this is Dan Ginsberg. We've been working with Valve and Lunar G to put together debugging tools for Vulkan. We thought it was very important to get these tools out there with you so that as you start bringing up your engines and your games, that you actually have tools to use to help you understand the API and, and how it's performing. And so what we put together is uh, what we'll be demoing primarily like a, we have a trace and replay system, so we can record all the API calls that are being made, save them out to a file. Um, in this case, it's uh, our we have a render system test that we use to make sure that our rendering engine is working properly. And we've generated traces, we've sent them out to other companies so that they can make sure that their implementation is also working correctly. And um, so I've created just a, like a 15 second trace file. Uh, it saves out to three or four hundred megs, it's not that big, it loads up pretty quickly in the UI. Um, okay, so, um, so I'm going to first start off with uh, just replaying it. So uh, what's interesting here, uh, you can see we've got a the frame counter here, that's actually from when we recorded. So we recorded this trace at 52, 58 frames per second and we can actually replay that faster. This, as we'll see in a second, uh, so that is our replayer of the trace file, and this is the same trace that we've loaded up in our uh, the Glade debugger tool. And I'm just gonna make it a little bit bigger here. So what you can see is that we're actually, I think the rendering is across, uh, the I don't know, maybe about 10 threads here. Uh, two of them, uh, the second two there, just kind of, they look pretty empty, but early on they do some resource loading. Uh, and you can see on the left side of this frame, it looks kind of sparse, and that's exactly where the demo, or the, the engine is loading resources from disk. But then you can see in the second half, uh, it's very much utilizing all the cores, and the kind of bottom portion there is generating command buffers, and the second two are uh, queuing those and rendering onto the, uh, uh, right around to, into the GPU. Uh, we can zoom in here. 
These are all the command buffer creations. And in other tools, people ask, can we click at the timeline and you know see what's going on? And so we can, we can click there. Uh, we'll see this is actually a, a wait for fences call. And what's happening is that we're waiting for the GPU to get done. So uh, we're definitely GPU limited here. We've got this nice feature that we can play through here. Uh, and the replayer will come up over here. As it's playing, we can, in that case, well, we can pause it and it's gonna jump over. Uh, we make sure to include the validation layers as part of this tool. We've had input in generating those, those layers. And uh, we can enable and disable layers from the tool. So you can turn on layers, run your replayer, and then down here in the output window, you'll get uh, any messages that might say either you've got performance warnings or other warnings uh, or errors. And we can also have the tool automatically pause when it detects those. So if you've got some automated traces running, you can run them overnight and they'll just pop back and you know, generate, uh, tell you where your errors are. Um, and it'll automatically pause and then uh, you can investigate it farther. Um, right now, uh, we do have uh, tabs that aren't appearing right now, because um, layers aren't enabled, to display like the draw state. So uh, you've seen a lot about those descriptor sets being built up, and you'll actually be able to visibly see a diagram that shows how they're linked together and, and inspect what's going on. Now, an interesting thing is when we put this tool together, uh, the very first, like, the first or second test that I ran when I got this, uh, the threading support in there was on a trace of Dota, and we realized right away that we're actually only using two or three threads, and it turned out that there was a minor bug in the engine that wasn't fully multi-threading it. Um, so as a result of fixing that, uh, let me shut this down and Daniel can start up. Um, so as a result of fixing that, then, uh, Dan's been working on the, the Source 2 backend uh, for Vulkan. And so he's got, uh, we're actually be running a demo of uh, Dota 2 running on Source 2 with the Vulkan backend. Um, so we're able to multi-thread that once we use this tool and realize that we weren't threading the way that we were expecting. Yeah, so as we wait for this to load, um, as Peter mentioned, we've been working on adding Vulkan support to the Source 2 engine. And uh, we've got some of the Dota content running on. And this demo shows uh, basically a very high draw call count where we have uh, a lot of characters uh, being rendered at once. And this, yeah, if you could just hold the mouse there. Um, this basically demonstrates our ability to uh, generate command buffers across multiple threads. And what we found is that uh, we're able to uh, substantially reduce the amount of time that we spend on our main submission thread because uh, the threads that we use for generating command buffers are a lot more efficient because more work is, is being done with Vulkan. And in this demo, we're actually entirely uh, GPU limited. Um, so what we're running on here, this is on the Lunar G sample implementation, which had been mentioned earlier. Um, we collaborated very closely with them, and um, we got the engine up on their driver, and the plan is that that open source implement, that implementation of uh, Vulkan will be open sourced and released at some point. Um, so, you know, we still have some performance tuning to do, like, uh, many of the other demos, but we've basically been able to demonstrate that we're going to be able to get better CPU efficiency out of using Vulkan and that uh, our engine can, can completely support it. So I think that's about it. Obviously, we're able to run code. We have an alpha header that, that is stable enough to enable us to do that. In fact, all the implementations you've seen are already out of date um, because we've made significant changes to the API since then. <coughs> Pardon me. We're in a, 
uh, an exciting time, and, and as a result of the crunch to get some cool demos for GDC, of course, we've learned things about the API. I expect uh, significant changes in the next couple of uh, weeks. Um, but we are definitely converging. Uh, you know, we have a lot of capability here, as you can see. Um, since you don't have a spec, of course, it kind of limits your ability to give us feedback on the API. Sorry about that. Uh, as it stabilizes, we will try to uh, get information out as, as uh, expeditiously as we can. If you do have feedback now, we'd love to hear it, uh, particularly things that are wrong-headed or uh, questions we failed to address, issues we failed to address. So the separate uh, feedback forums for the Vulcan API and for the Spearby. Uh, Spearby, of course, there is a spec, and we encourage you to go read it and look at the tools, because the tools are up to it. Um, uh, if your uh, company wants to, feels that it's mission critical enough to be involved in creating this and shaping it to your own ends, Kronos is an open organization, you can join. It's not that expensive. Uh, and uh, I guess the last thing I would say is watch the space. We're making great pro progress. Uh, we will certainly have uh, uh, initial specifications and more readable material out later this year. Um, exactly when, I don't know, we, we're trying to, to discipline ourselves to say, first time out, we can't get it wrong. So we cannot be uh, absolutely slaves to a date, but it's gonna happen this year. There's no, there's no danger that it won't. Um, so that's where we are. Uh, what we're gonna do now, I think, is bring up all of the talkers, talking heads, and uh, take your question. <coughs> So we have about uh, 15 minutes, and um, we'd love to get your questions. Um, we've been asking each other questions for months, and it's good to get some new ones. <laughs> so uh, does anyone have any questions that they want to, to ask? Yeah, go ahead. Can we the, the new chair of uh, Michael is having pretty much based on OCL, and also on the OCL environments, continuous uh, platforms. Um, I cannot think of any any examples where it would be actually useful. But is it possible to run shaders on on CPU? Yes, it's. Uh, yeah, there's 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 some technical reason. driver implementers will come with um, uh, a heterogeneous uh, approach in, in, in how you can deal with 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 shaders. Yeah, I, I, I can comment on that. Um, we can have a CPU, CPU implementation of OCL. Yeah. I don't address the differences on the speed is not That's true. Yeah, I think right right I mean, Spirby is a brand new language, which is being shared by both both of the and the graphics. Yeah, and I, I, I think he was just asking since 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 the OpenCL side of Spirby is like the CPUs, why not the graphic side? And yeah, okay. I, 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 it could be in practice what Tom's about to say. <laughs> in, in practice, what Tom's about to say is is uh, uh, Graham's already described the support for multiple devices yes. in Vulkan. So it's certainly possible to discover that, oh, there's a device here which, by the way, only exposes a compute queue. It has no graphics queue at all. Mm -hmm. um, but it, here is its characteristics as a compute device. Uh, and so you can then proceed to create uh, uh, you know, all the other infrastructure that Graham talked about in order to be able to send command buffers to it. Mm -hmm. So the, the API would support it. It's just a question of whether right. there's demand. That, that's something that you guys get to help. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, uh, I had a couple questions. Uh, first, uh, I guess this is mostly to the hardware vendors. Uh, do you foresee that the reduced draw call overhead using Vulkan will mean that texture atlasing is not necessary anymore, or will that still be a, a 
recommended technique. And uh, I guess I'll wait on my second question. Right. So um, I guess you make atlasing in order to avoid the drug, reduce your drug call count. Like for yeah. a user interface, it's pretty standard to atlas all your Yeah, binding and everything. Um, you know, yeah. So atlasing for things like uh, unwrapping UVs and things like that, you probably still do want to have like a texture with texture coordinates and not just build all this place. It's for memory access padding reasons. Um, in terms of binding, like I said, the, the descriptor sets themselves can be arbitrarily large. Um, so you just have, part of the reason for, for atlasing is that you don't want to go bind texture, draw, bind texture, draw. And the only reason you've broken your draw calls up is because they use different sets of textures. So if you just bind all the textures, one massive great big descriptor set, then you can just throw draws in without necessarily um, breaking them up. And you know, drivers, depending on how smart they are, might be able to coalesce and say, oh, hey, the last thing is command buffer to draw, so I'm just going to make it a bit longer because you haven't changed anything else. Little things like that we will maybe do at the command buffer level, but we're not going to you know, try and do anything crazy. So, yeah, I don't know if anybody else wants to comment. I'm actually going to come in. I don't think there's anything else to add. Yeah, my second question was, uh, so one of my bugaboos about OpenGL for a long time has been that it's an object-oriented design that doesn't use an object-oriented language. Uh, and it looks like Vulkan is going to be a C-based API again. Uh, so uh, is there a rationale behind not using C++? Uh, could you describe that? We had a screaming fight about it and I lost. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, actually, probably I'm not the right person. Um, if you have a C++ program and you call it C API, that's really quite trivial. If you have a C API, you want to call it in a C++ or if you have a C++ API, you want to call it in a C-like language. That becomes a lot harder. Um, Object-oriented and having classes are not synonyms for one another, right? Um, the Vulkan API takes as a first parameter the object upon which it operates always, which basically is this. If we just change the name of that parameter to this, you have an object-oriented API. And it's trivial to write a C++ wrapper around it if that floats your boat. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 it is an object-oriented API. Uh, there is no like implied state or current state or anything like that. There's no side effects outside of the parameters you're passing into that. Object and the scope changes of what happens to an object when you operate on it is, is quite well defined. Uh, so yeah, choice of language versus choice of program model are they're all functional things, I think. Okay, good question. I would say we did also have feedback from from a number of the engine vendors that they prefer uh, a really bare bones feeling that they get. Yeah. Do we pass that back? All right, so um, I did notice when we were going through the slides that there was a, a sort of uh, GPU allocation API. I uh, just had some basic questions about that. On a UMA architecture unified memory sort of thing, is that going to go away and I can just pass pointers directly from the CPU about a texture, or does it need to be sort of like in a compressed or teleformat format first, or um, that sort of thing? How is uh, UMA supported in the system? Um, it's it's you won't pass pointers into the into the API. You you will ask uh, as as Graham pointed out. You'll ask the object what memory requirements it has. Some of those will include uh, you know pools that things need to be allocated from whatever. Uh, just because we have the luxury of one unified memory uh, space doesn't mean that we don't jump through the same hoops. Um, the, there's some things that I think Graham didn't go into because um, they're, uh, well, it probably would have doubled the length of at least a couple of those slides. But the, so, for example, the texture upload path is, is something where that I think you're sort of asking about, right? And, and you'll, you'll provide whatever you've got on disk, and th there'll be a job, the, the, an, a an actual, uh, not a draw command, but, it, but sort of like that, where, where you ask the driver to prepare that image into its optimal format. And so it's a, kind of a lot of code to do something that was 
done under the covers for the driver in the first place. But no, I mean, the GP memory is still managed by you, uh, but, but, it's, but it's allocated and free and referenced when you say that's okay. I don't know if you said you want to add anything else. Yeah, based on your experience. No, we, we have the same experience as you guys for that. Because so, yeah. we operate it's much the same system architecture between us and, and our right? it's, it's the same way. So we I do have a second question, which is, um, do you have uh, virtualized GPU memory, or if two applications have just blown out the uh, amount of memory in the GPU, do you just get an error back and you're just toast? You're, you're talking about exhausting physical memory? Uh, yeah, well, the GPU memory. Like, if there's just a lot of applications that exhaust all the memory, uh, what's the error condition for that like? Um, it's your fault. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, so, so at least in our case, the, all the new CPUs and GPUs are, are both 64-bit capable, so there's no issues there with address space for us. Um, so the question is, well, I don't really actually have a gigabyte of memory, and, and you're talking about a, a UMA situation. Um, and so you're, you're talking about both the allocations that are done from your allocator on the system memory side that Graham talked about when you pass in the allocator pointers, and the GPU allocations that you do out of effectively that same block of memory. you got to track that. Okay. If, if you if you ask for more memory and it's gone, it's it's gone. Um, and, and you know the, the some of the other stuff that I know we've discussed a lot, and uh, Graham probably can talk about it a little better than I can. But the behavior of what happens as memory gets lower, or as you ask for different types of memory from certain platforms, in terms of residency and pinning and all that, is very platform specific, and it's I can't give you an across the board answer for that. Okay. Okay. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, it's totally fair. Questions? If I, you. So if I if I query a device of how much memory is on it, and then do sort of a malloc of that memory, if someone another application has allocated memory, I might get a fail or, or return a zero. So if I say like, do you have a gigabyte of memory? And it says yes, then I'll like 500 megs of that, and I get zero back because between those two calls, someone else allocated. Correct? Do I have to check when I actually do allocation that it did actually happen? Yeah, on the multi-application platform. Yes, yeah, so you're definitely okay. going to have to share the same physical memory with other apps. And then different platforms will deal with this in different ways. For example, um, running on Windows, um, uh, all the memory stuff is going to go through the Microsoft WDBM layer. Um, and that's why whenever you make submission of commands to the, uh, to the GPU for Vulkan, you have to give it a residency. So you have to be say, hey, these are the specific pieces of memory that I'm going to be using. Um, and then it's up to WDM on those platforms that do this to actually page in uh, the physical, me um, the, you know, the data that you need to use um, for that particular app. So, you, so there's a, a level between bulk and, and the memory management going on. Um, Later this year. Do you want to track track project? Project? You can talk about it if you want. I have a question about just the uh, You said that the Vulcan is definitely better optimized for direct or and tile rotors, both or tile GPUs kind of working and it's on the basically the same code. But for instance, um, what kind of information is the driver going to be able to provide the program in terms of device capabilities? For instance, a tile render is going to be much, much better with um, Z fail than a direct render and things like that. Is there going to be a kind of more enhanced you know, GPU capabilities provided to the program so it knows what to do? I'm talk about what's in the API now. This is not a settled question. But. So I, I briefly alluded to uh, the get GPU info um, query there. This and enumerate that you pass in what kind of information you have, and I, I said, you know, this relative performance and amount of memory and things like that. I mean, the list is not finalized. If we can find a way to neatly abstract, you know, general class of GPU or something, that is the kind of thing that we could provide those hints. Uh, in general, though, I mean, this is what we really want to be able to do is to say, if you have these features, you can use them. Um, and we want, you know, 
mobile cloud-based renderers and immediate renderers. I mean, there are immediate ren renderers in the mobile space today. And there are also, theoretically, there's no reason you couldn't scale up the cloud renderer for desktop. So just because it's a certain performance profile doesn't mean it's not going to work, right? So, um, you know, I, ideally, you still have to use render passes on a desktop GPU, even though we don't strictly need them. They're still helpful, but the, the tilers really, really need that. But you still have to use them regardless. So code to the API, not to necessarily the hardware platform, and everything will work out. Yep. Will it uh, still be a good idea to sort geometry by material? Less of a good idea? Uh, I mean, one, one of the main reasons that you would sort by material on traditional APIs is because the software cost of switching all the finding new textures and changing state and everything is very high. But there is still some GPU cost to those things. You know, if you do a bunch of draws back to back that all access different textures and then come back and access the same texture again, it's probably not in the cache anymore. So if you can sort by general memory access patterns and things, those are those are going to still be important things, but I wouldn't go nuts trying to like bucket everything into little state buckets and things like that. You can pretty much just throw the work at the GPU and then it'll eat it up. Hi, my question is, is it possible to build a common buffer from GPU? Like a computer shader? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there a plan for doing that? Um, I, we, not, I can't really say uh, plans. I mean, command buffers are just memory, and computer shaders can write memory, right? So, in theory, in quotes, yes, you can do that. Um, I, yeah, we haven't even got close to that, but at least at the sort of standard body level in some kind of neutral way that maybe. I think it's a reasonable step, not necessarily a next step. Thank you. say we don't have a, it's not a vendor neutral serialization format at this point. Um, so uh, it's going to be a binary blob that's provided by the driver that is totally opaque and proprietary. And um, you could certainly, I think, cache them from run to run of the application. But even driver versions might break them and um, break compatibility. But yeah, we're not. In theory, you could have a vendor neutral blob for Over time, but whilst there's still questions, and if you need to walk out, please feel free. No shame. But whilst there's still questions, let's keep going. I showed up a bit late, so have you guys talked about context creation? What context? What context? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of the worries I had is like, how is this all going to piece into uh, the current like you know uh, X11 way to create context and Windows way to create context? Because those things like yeah, are pretty tight to the protocol of how to draw a count. Like yeah, the yeah, all of that is gone. Oh, cool. Nice. The <laughs> <laughs> perfect answer. Okay, last chance. Any questions? Actually, we had one question from earlier. People have a minute. How long is a Hello World program? Well, um, well that's actually instructive. Yeah, in the last session, somebody asked, um, how does the Hello World program look? How, you know, how big is it? So I consider Hello World for OpenGL as in, if you're using the compatibility mode for OpenGL, it's begin, vertex, 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 end, and you can draw a triangle. Right? The equivalent of that, because I, this is the first test I did, was 600 lines of code for Vulkan versus Y. However, keep in mind that a lot of that 600 lines of code that I wrote are now reusable for all kinds of other things in Vulkan. It's just, it's, you, you need to implement your own 
building blocks in order to do something. So it's not like you know, for every five lines of code, you get six hundred lines of Vulkan. It's not like that. Um, but this, I mean, that's why Vulkan exists. Is it gives the power to the application engineer to to control the GPU directly, exactly how they want to. Yes, and so yeah, it's actually going to be up to everybody here <coughs> to provide libraries and layers and. Tiny add to that. So, yeah, the, 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 the tools and, and layers framework, they're all going to be available open source when, when the spec goes live. The, the guys at, at, at Valve Energy are, are ensuring that. And, and also, the uh, we didn't talk about conformance testing, uh, but the conformance test uh, suite effort will also, uh, will also be done in, in an open source way. And so, you'll have tons of tools to help you do code generation and also tons of examples <laughs> and, and plenty of opportunities to say, well, I'm running into this problem and you'll be able to you know, contribute things as long as it's something described in the spec to contribute, contribute those tests back to the conformance suite. So I think that'll, that'll kind of help things along as well. Yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, last question. <coughs> so previous iterations of Spirit we were based on LVMIR. Um, there's been some talk about the idea of like there being translations between IR and Spear, uh, Spear B rather. And um, are, do you guys have any interest or any plans to integrate uh, Spear B serialization and conversion in and out of LVMIR and actually contributing it back to the LVM community? Yeah, that, so there's two. The, the, the open cell answer, I, I believe, the open cell group announced yesterday that they're writing trans, translators for both directions and that this will be available. I'm, I, I don't know the exact situation of that. It's going to be yeah. And, and, and then on, on the graphics side, so, so, so far I've made available, um, Lunergy has this Lunar Glass middle end optimizing transform based on LVM. And, and a couple of days ago, I, I, I announced that, that the, we have a translator from Sphere V to LLVM for, for, for that use of LLVM, but, but not yet the other direction. Did, did that answer your question? Uh, the, the only other thing is, do you uh, foresee contributing this into LVM and actually having an LVM ah, itself be able to generate? That would be great. Yeah, I mean, maybe yeah, we, we we need to talk talk again with the LLVM folks and yeah, we're I would work. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 let's, let's, let's get together after this. Okay. Yeah, we, we love LLVM. Yeah, we 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 we, we yeah, we'd be happy to have LLVM take some of this upstream or whatever whatever is best to do. Cool. Yep. So. Thank you all very much. I think we have we have a good oh, oh we have a good so we have a beautiful Kronos backpack, especially crafted for this very one of a kind. And so the second gift of the Will Greenberg and Bliss Mobile. Yes. Hey, awesome. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. About this as we are, uh, as I said, watch the space and I get involved if you are interested in it. And uh, I'll look forward to talking to you later in the year with uh, more exciting stuff. All right.